Very good, thank you. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. I've got 638. I thank you all for coming, both those in person and uh, with us through uh, the uh, internet. And I'd like to start the meeting um, by asking you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First of all, I'd like to welcome our uh, sister town, Willington Board of Selectmen here. Um, thank you for having welcome. us. Welcome. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, one of the nice things about working with a neighbor is, is uh, we share a lot of things together. And, and um, I know Erica's boards and boards before mine, and uh, I've done this for a number of years. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, having you here. Um, our board, the Board of Selectmen from Asher, are here. Uh, Catherine Silversmith, Roger Phillips. I'm Bill Folletti, first selectman. Erica? Uh, Erica Wyshynski, first selectman in Willington. And online with us, we have selectman uh, Jim Bulick and selectwoman Liza Borix. Erica, Thank you both for joining us. Absolutely. Would you be so kind to read, uh, read the uh, notice of the meeting? Yes. Uh, legal notice, special selectmen's meetings, Willington Ashford Community Public Hearing, Thursday, September 8th, 2022, 6.30 p.m. Residents of the town of Willington and Ashford are hereby notified and warned that a public informational hearing will be held on Thursday, September 8th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the town of Ashford Municipal Office's lower level meeting room in person, virtually via Zoom and in hybrid format. The public informational hearing will be for the purpose of hearing and receiving input on possible uses of the Cato Rock property, which came into the possession of the towns of Ashford and Willington in November of 2021 through the tax sale process. William Folletti, Roger Phillips, Catherine e. Silversmith, Erica Wyshynski, Eliza Boritz, uh, Jim Bulick. Thank you, Erica. Um, as you uh probably heard with the reading of the notice, this is a public hearing and our boards are in union with, at this point, we're gonna be taking your input. Those of you who are here in person, of course, those of you who are on Zoom. Um, there'll be no votes uh, taken tonight by either of our boards. We are scheduling a, a future, a really soon, um, selectments meeting combined that we will be sharing our impression of what we're hearing tonight and hopefully drawing some conclusions. Um, the idea of this is we've got, and one of the reasons that prompted us uh, doing this, as well as wanting to hear from you folks in general anyway, is that we've got a, a next round of uh, grants coming up, uh, Brownfields grants, and they're due the end of this month. And we intend on making some of the comments that we hear from everybody and the conclusions that the boards of selectmen reach in that application form. Um, so that's where we're gonna go. Just a couple of quick ground rules. Um, to start with, we're going to allow uh, three minutes for individuals to speak um, to the boards. Anybody in this room, we'd ask to come up to the podium, identify yourselves, uh, give us your street, we don't need your number, um, and also the town that you're, you're from, um, just so, He's made, this meeting is being recorded and it'd be a lot easier to refer to uh, whatever comments are if we know who you are. Um, Erica, anything else you would Sure, so just for uh, information's sake, the microphone that um, will help folks online to hear us here in the room is here on the table. So when you're at the podium, I encourage you to uh, you know, help your voice to carry a bit. If you can't hear us online, um, give a wave and, and we'll see if we can't address it. Um, if people want to speak online, I encourage you to utilize the hand raise feature under uh, reactions, um, or if you're on the screen, um, kind of give us a wave. We do have someone monitoring that so that we can make sure that we hear from everyone. All right. Okay, anybody have any questions that are here? No? Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce Sam Hayda, 
of BL Companies. Um, Sam, if you'd uh, introduce yourself and your, uh, your cohorts here that have been working with you on this project. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, besides the public hearing, we want to give you just a very brief overview of our technical people that have been working on this for several years now. Uh, introduce them to you, give them an opportunity. Um, and also we'll hear from our legal counsel that's also been working with, in conjunction with BL companies and also with EPA and DEEP and whoever else you need to get their ear. So Sam, do you wanna take it from there and just give us a brief overview from your side? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, you can hear me, correct? Thumbs up somebody? Great, okay. Um, I am a licensed environmental professional. Uh, I'm a principal at BL Companies. Uh, and BL Companies was hired back in, I wanna say 2018, uh, to perform additional investigation of the environmental conditions at the Cadle Rock properties. Uh, that work was funded with a, uh, a, a previous DECD municipal assessment grant that the towns of Ashford and Willington were awarded. Um, and as part of that work, we conducted various phases of environmental investigation. Um, and I will take, I will provide a high level overview of those in uh, just a minute. Um, also, as part of our team, uh, we had Val Farrow, we have Val Farrow on our team and she's with you in the room tonight. I unfortunately have a seven o'clock, a conflict at seven o'clock and I have a hard stop. So I'm going to provide my overview and then I will have to scoot out. But uh, Val's role uh, as a planner uh, was to assist us with evaluating the uh, conditions of the property that we identified and to help evaluate potential um, uses uh, of the property for the future. And, and Val can speak more specifically about exactly what her role was. Um, so um, with our work that we did uh, under the previous grant, we held two public forums. The first was after we completed a phase one environmental site assessment to talk about our findings at that time. And the second was after we had completed what we call a phase two site investigation where we went out and collected soil and groundwater samples. Um, so um, I'm gonna provide a high level overview, a more detailed overview of, of that work that we did should be available uh, via a PowerPoint that we prepared and presented uh, to the public back in, I believe it was the end of 2020. Um, so, uh, but if I could, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and uh, can you all see that slide? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, just to give you an overview, there has been environmental investigation and remediation at the Cato Rock properties beginning back in 1992. There have been several phases of environmental investigation, the earliest starting in 92, but throughout the 90s, a substantial amount of investigation in the, two, in the mid 2000s when EPA got involved. There was a subsequent investigation uh, uh, that was uh, done, uh, but it was uh, sort of overseen by DEP in 2013, and then our investigation that was done in 2020. So there has been lots of work that has been done there. There's also been several phases of environmental remediation. There was some work done in 99, but the majority of the work was done in 2007 and 2008. And again, that work was done under the uh, direction of EPA. And there they hired contractors to perform that work. Key findings of the work that's been done to date is that there has been no impact to surrounding drinking water wells based on testing that was done in 92, 2007, and again in 2008. During the remediation work that was done in 2007 and 2008, there was over 5,000 tons of uh, contaminated soil removed from the property and over 200 tons of solid waste. So that's a very important to remember that, that there was a tremendous amount of work done early on. 
when we got involved and began our work in 2018, we saw no obvious signs of releases or environmental degradation on the property, other than some various small areas where there were some metal pipe or some other uh, solid waste, but no, no stress vegetation, no obvious uh, contamination, uh, things of that nature. Our work, which involved extensive sampling of soil, groundwater, and sediment and surface water, identified no contaminants in on-site groundwater or surface water. We did identify some regulated compounds just slightly above Connecticut DEEP action levels in only three soil samples and one sediment sample. Uh, so those were very positive findings. Um, and we since, uh, since doing that testing, we have prepared a remedial action plan, uh, which could be used as the basis for implementing remediation that calls for excavation and offsite disposal of those, uh, those three areas of soil and the one area of sediment that are slightly above standards, as well as removal of any remaining surface trash. Um, and again, there's not a tremendous amount, but there are some areas where there's some old culverts um, and some other uh, areas where solid waste and debris is present. Uh, so that, that's the high level overview. Um, and as I said, there, there is uh, more detail about what we did and where we tested in that 2020 PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I think uh, given that high level overview from my perspective, um, the, the focus of this site now, we need to complete the remediation and that's hopefully the purpose of the grant, but the focus can now move from investigation and remediation to determining what the future use of the property will be. There really is no restriction to use of the property based on the findings that we have. And our, our remediation, our remedial plan will not require any restrictions for any type of use. And once those soils and sediments are removed, I will produce, hopefully I will produce, or an LEP will produce a, what's called a verification report, which will indicate that the site is in compliance with Connecticut's remediation standard regulations and that no further action is required. So, so that's my overview. With that, I will turn it back to uh, the selectmen to, uh, I think, move into the more important component for this discussion, which is potential future uses. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. Val, we're going to turn the floor over to you for a brief presentation. If you would like, um, sure. We'll give, uh, I'll use my slides. All right. <clears throat> I'm Val Farrell from Literate Advisors, and I've been on Sam's team for, um, seems like forever, Sam. Um, <laughs> When we originally negotiated the scope with the town, we were thinking, okay, we gotta dig into this investigation. We have to understand, you know, what is going on out there? Is it clean, is it not clean? We went through that. As we are finishing that, we had a discussion with the uh, selectmen and, and the folks who basically were coming to our meetings. Do we continue to move forward or what do we need to do? Or we really look to, to Ann to give us some guidance. And, we knew that we really had some things to take care of first, which Ann can talk about later. Yes. Can we check and make sure that everybody on the web is, is able to hear Kelsey? I mean, from I this distance. Can, can you go, uh, Liza or Jim? Can you can tell us if you can hear us in the room? Yeah. And, okay. Okay. You okay. can go through the participants tab to make sure. Just ask them. Just mute everyone and unmute yeah. us. At this point, Kelsey would uncheck mute themselves, <laughs> unmute themselves. If you go down, just click on the presentation. Yeah, no. there you go. That's right. Yeah. This is. There we go. Sorry, we muted uh, everyone so that um, we didn't have a, a problem with with that kind of feedback. All right, Kelsey, if you'll just close that window. Okay. All right. Thank you, Val. Sorry, just so on. So, uh, very briefly, what, what we did was we we didn't really embark on a market study or 
what we call development feasibility study because we weren't quite sure what was going to happen on the legal side. Um, and that turned out to be a, a good decision because if we had gone and looked into things and decided certain things, well, what has happened? Three years have passed. And in terms of market and demand, that's like an attorney. Okay. So we're glad. Hey, I would have loved to work on this and say this is what we could have done, but I couldn't really stand up before you tonight and say to what I didn't. 2019 or whenever was valid because it really isn't because the market has changed as you all know you don't need to tell you that so when we're doing redevelopment you know i often use this graphic um it shows you how you know multi-tenant it is but tentacles everywhere how do you deal with this you know we've got all these aspects so it's not just about dirt it's not just about contamination there's other things you have to worry about Anne is here. She'll tell you about the legal hurdles, and that's been a big deal. Um, but there are other things that I did start looking at while we were doing the investigations. Land use and topo, and just general things. I also started going out to the market. I kind of worked my, my contacts. I talked to developers, even talked to other municipalities to see what, what was going on. And, you know, by and large, we figured that what's going to happen out there is going to be really localized because of where it's located on an access point, which is not exactly on a highway. It's near a small town. Um, it's very picturesque. There's a lot of wetlands. There's topo. There's all sorts of things. So it's not a flat site. So number one is, all right, that physical, physical challenge. So as you go through this, you understand if you're looking at developability, you look at the physical aspects as well as the market aspects. And there's various ways to do that. You turn it into you know, an analysis of market using data. You can go to a broker. There's, there's obviously a lot of ways to do it. In the end of the day, all of these little circles have to be marked. Okay? And obviously, at the top is a lead role. Who's going to take, you know, who's going to take the leadership? And at the bottom of that is implementation. You want to have something done. Next slide. <clears throat> so one of the things that might be helpful is to do a bona fide development feasibility, where there would be mapping and we'd apply wetlands and topo and look at what physically could lay out there. What we don't look at right away is to zone because we might need to change the zone. That you folks, we're going to hear from you folks, we might want to change that. Okay. So I don't know if you can read all that, but basically, there's a physical stuff that we do, and then development considerations that are applied. And in the end, you folks, the town, decide what's going to happen. So it's a little bit more of an, um, an information and <coughs> data uh, uh, gathering process that marries with the environment. And then that, the third prong of that, is what Anna brings to the table in terms of legal and what we have to do to move this along. Okay. So if you have questions, we can talk about that later. That's basically, you know, where we would go. Okay. Okay. So if you could. Uh... That's all great, and we can hear you fine. But we're getting some folks saying they can't quite hear. So sometimes when you turn around the room, okay. there are some drawbacks to hybrid. So when they start speaking, <laughs> yeah. you should probably move speak this forward or speak this way. Speak I think that's where it turns. Yeah. 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 So turn your back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little sideways. Oh, okay. We can turn that so they're facing. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm fine either way. Yeah. Okay. Let me Thank just you, say a few words then um, about where we are from a legal perspective, because I do want to make sure that there's few minutes for Sam in case anyone has questions for him, but he may be gone already. So I'll try to handle it. <laughs> Bottom line is, as everyone knows, the site's been a bit of a, uh, in a legal state of flux, a bit of imbroglio with the property owners for decades. And that has resolved itself. The town foreclosed on the properties and we ended up entering into an agreement uh, where the town is ordered and approved by the court, we now own the properties. And that is a huge milestone um, because now we can control these properties' fate. And we own, the, the towns collectively own all of them. So that, coupled with all of the good work that Sam has done, where we know 
what level of contamination exists today on the property, which that needs to be remediated, isn't much, which is good news. We've done an awful lot of work. Isn't much left and remaining looking to apply for the last bit of grants. But the Department of Environmental and Community Development, indeed, who uh, provide the grants, will be looking for what's the use? What are you going to do with this town? And it runs the spectrum of public use, community use, private use, housing, retail, residential, commercial. Um, so we're at the beginning stages of what are we going to do with the property? What is it? The, um, the, the, an impediment that we've heard for years, which is true, are the liens that EPA and DEP have on the property. EPA went in decades ago, cleaned it up, put liens on the property. I'm working with EPA and the Department of Justice right now on an agreement with them um, in order to get the, the liens released. It becomes a function of what's going to happen to the properties. Um, is it going to be a public use? Is it going to be a private use? Um, there's a lot of questions and factors that they're being, uh, they're raising and they want to be fair with us. They're not going to say, oh no, you're going to have to pay us the four, I can't see without these, $4.3 million. They're not saying that at all. And DEP, we'll, theirs is a lot less and we'll get through the process with DEP. We'll get the orders released so that in the event we look to convey the property to a private developer, we'll be able to move through the process more of a on a streamlined basis like any normal real estate transaction. So we're in a really good place right now so that we can really and meaningfully ask you all and have the selectmen consider what are we what are the towns going to do with these properties. So that's why we're here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, Sam Val, and we, we appreciate it. We know we put you under a bit of a burden because you've been doing years of due diligence on this whole project, and we ask you to condense it into a few minutes of discussion. But um, are there any questions that anybody have of what you've heard so far, either here or on the web? I think we should go right into public comment. Sounds good. We're going to open the floor then for uh, public comment. And um, again, we would ask you if you're speaking as an individual at this point, try to limit it to three minutes. If you're speaking on behalf of a uh, committee or department uh, or a group of people, it'll be five minutes. And um, we'll be a little flexible on that, but not much, at least for the first round. Anybody here? Uh, okay. At least one selection. Who Liza would love them. Has her Liza has her hand raised. Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, my quick question. So I know that there's been a lot of remediation already done, and um, uh, the groundwater looks good, and the um, you know, all of that looks fine right now. Um, a legal question: If there are issues in the future with any any groundwater that does emerge as being problematic, um. Is there is there any a is there any potential of that and b if there is what's the liability of the town should we um, have sold it to like a private developer or houses have been built on the property? Um, two part question. First is the groundwater has been tested over the years quite a bit and it's fully compliant with the criteria according according to Sam. So if, there, if it appears as if there are groundwater issues, it's because something's going on out there today and the town owns the property today. So it would be the town's responsibility and liability to deal with any releases that may occur today. Uh, there's no reason to believe there are any releases, but it would all be on the town. I don't think it, it, contamination like this, given all the work that's been done isn't latent because uh, we have soil as well as extensive soil sediment, extensive groundwater testing. So it's not as if we know that, well, we still have a packet of something or pocket of something in the, in the soil that's gonna one day enter the groundwater. We don't have that. We know, Sam knows that where those areas are, what limitations are left and, and it's very uh, manageable and small. So we don't 
C, foresee any uh, groundwater issues going forward based upon the historical contamination. So the town's liability and responsibility would largely be very limited to whatever the towns would cause today. I see Loretta there. Loretta, you've got your hand up. Can I just remind folks to um, identify themselves for the record? Yes. Loretta, if you'd identify yourself with your street and town. Certainly. Loretta, 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 Loretta Robo. Pump board. Loretta Robo, Pumpkin Hill Road. I'm the chair of the Ashford Conservation Commission. And I would we have a proposal of using the land as a um, public use land. And we have done this proposal, we have created this proposal while understanding what the dy dynamics are of the land and what the contours are, being that there's a lot of wetlands and a lot of water on this property, a lot of steep slopes. So what we are looking at, what we are thinking about, what is the best use um, for the town and also for all the residents. So we came up with some, um, what we consider as good suggestions about how everyone can benefit from this, uh, again, based on the nature of the land right now presently. So we've come up with both long-term and short-term use. The short-term use we see it would be um, for residents to use this diverse natural area um, for passive recreation and education. There's also part of the Nipmuc Trail, which is mostly in the Willington section, and the Nipmuc Trail could be greatly enhanced and um, improved on that. And we, as a conservation commission, has, have always worked with the Willington Conservation, particularly in the past, we've worked on Langheimer. Uh, creating trails together. And so we have a history with that. And then um, the third thing that we would be interested in is to look at somehow creating a resource center um, for, for the property where people could come and um, look at what the property is like and provide, and we could provide them with some education about the natural setting. It, would, it could also be a place for demo projects and, in, and a lot of initiatives, such as um, demonstration plot projects like plantings for native flora, pollinator gardens. Um, we could also do uh, natural wildlife habitat education and pollinator gardens. And this would also give people a chance to see how they themselves could enhance their natural, th their garden areas or their particular um, property owns that they have. The other um, thing that we felt would could be used there is to have community gardens of both, both veggies and flower gardens. And this could be used also as models, but also for people who don't have appropriate garden space in their particular dwelling. The, the other big thing that we thought about um, is that to use it with the passive rec recreation, this would include walking, hiking, dog, dog walking, running, um, nature walks, plant identification, horseback riding, sh snowshoeing, cross country skiing, and other kinds of passive recreation. The, the other thing that we thought was really important, this is a very large piece of property. It has a lot of potential on it. So we felt it would be a good idea to develop um, a resource, a study group to look at this and the study group containing a lot of residents who are interested in how this space can be used and um, to talk about and look at the long-term use. What we are suggesting short-term would not in any way create a problem for anything that comes in the future because it's minimal impact on the present land. Um, and also it, it's something that doesn't cost a lot of money we have contacted Yale Forest and the uh, director there, Mike Ashton, uh, is willing to do a forest management plan for us in the fall of 2023. Um, and this is something that's positive because it, our, what we're proposing would open it up to all residents in the town and give everyone a chance to enjoy this beautiful piece of property. So I will now turn it over. I think Steve um, is here. 
who is also part of our Conservation Commission. He can just go over briefly some of the reasons why we're talking about how to best use this property. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm hoping I can share my screen. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so we, as part of the, uh, this, this information is on a website. It's, it's up at the top here. Um, sorry for the busyness of my screen, but um, we defined the, some of the physical characteristics of the Cato Rock properties. And, and there's a narrative uh, in our document that discusses that. Um, it may be easier to show you um, various um, maps and, and uh, extractions from Google Earth that, that describe the property fairly well. If you look at it, um, you would think it's you know a wooded property, but um, as Loretta mentioned, there are considerable wetlands on this property, and and uh, if you can see my my screen, uh, I'm going to go over some of the bigger wetland areas that um, that you can find here. This is a, a pretty large wetland here. There's one there. There's one here. There's a pond right there. Um, this is Moritz Pond and the surrounding area is quite extensive uh, and very wet. In here, it's, it's wet. There's more wet back here. There's a brook. You can almost see the, uh, the outline of the brook uh, comes from the, the high ground. Up here is, is the highlands. These are highlands. And, and this is higher elevation than, um, than Moritz, which is lowest, lowest elevation area. Uh, this is essentially a bowl that, that you see. Um, uh, I have a 3D um, Google Earth photo. It may be a little difficult to tell, in, um, but if you visit the website, um, you can see it better. But essentially everything drains this way and this way. And, and these wetlands are all interconnected by little streams that eventually flow into Moritz Pond and onto um, the Mount Hope River eventually. Um, you can also see that there are residences here, here, and here, and here. Uh, and then, of course, everything along uh, Giant Oak Lane and some on uh, Kurosi Road. Um, uh, the purple here are stone walls that can be found. They're predominantly in the, the northwest part of the property. Um, tried to outline the, all the, the wetlands. There's, I think, 41 acres of wetlands. There's 20 acres, almost 20 acres of um, what I'll call fields. Um, these were, these two I know were formerly cultivated. Um, I'm not so sure about, about these. Um, also notice that this, this field is actually part of this property. Um, uh, I don't know if that's an issue. Um, this is the uh, Google Earth uh, 3D view. Um, again, I think you maybe need to visit the website and study it in detail. You can blow things up uh, and, and see things. But um, so much of this information comes from, from Google Earth and from, from NECOG. NECOG, um, it's... Uh, Maybe somebody can help me out. It's the Northeast Council of uh, Governments. Government. Yeah, Council of Governments. And they, they offer GIS services that, that show various, you can overlay um, many different features onto parcels. And uh, it, can be, it can be used to, to uh, show anything, uh, wetlands, farmland soils, um, uh, various uh, town uh, buildings, parcels, all, all that. Um, here's a, a 
photo of the parcel with a, a red outline of the property. You can see a, a small pond here. This is a field that's opposite Howard Road, another field. These fields over here are along the, um, mostly, they're mostly in Wellington. They're right along the town line, which runs about like that. Uh, the Nipmuc Trail comes in from Marsh Road over here, follows uh, the, the property a bit on the, right along the northern border and then exits um, on the north side. Uh, once again, here's a, here's a wetland. Um, and let me go to the next one. Um, there's a, oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. This is uh, another photo uh, showing that this is looking east, kind of northeast. Uh, Moritz Pond, another substantial marshy area, uh, a one acre pond, the fields again. You can see a ridge line here. Um, it drains, it, you know, everything goes downhill along here. These uh, red outlines here are uh, property lots, private owners. Uh, this is Route 44 in here. Um, let's see, um, another view. This is the, the wetlands looking west toward the, um, the town line, the uh, Ashford Wellington town line. Um, one more view, same, essentially the same thing, but looking more north. Uh, this is Moritz Pond. It's, uh, it's a shallow pond. It has lots of shrubbery and low growth uh, in it. Um, and this is, uh, uh, Loretta talked about um, community gardens. Uh, we thought we'd throw in a picture of uh, the Mansfield community gardens, which are have been established for, oh, 20, 30 years. Um, and they have some pretty cool uh, service, services there. They do have water, they have a little building. You can do some really interesting things because this parcel could support that. Um, it's, it's quite large. Um, can but, we just ask you to kind of come to a conclusion? Yes, as yeah, you're, you're, I'm you're over reaching your time limit. You're over I, seven minutes. I'm yeah. sorry. I thought the physical be the uh, description <laughs> would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but I tend to, to wander on. But I am, I'm essentially done unless someone has questions. Steve, if you could put um, the website in, in the chat box, people could then see it and go Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. That's a great idea, Loretta. Sure. Thank I'll you. Put, I'll, I'll add that there. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank is there you, anyone Steve. in the room? You're welcome. Wanted to speak? I'm at Tayman, uh, Lisa Lane in Wellington. Uh, I'm very familiar with this property. Um, I represented Cable Rock for the last 20 years in connection with, but that's not why I'm here. Uh, I've hunted this property for the last 20 years, more than that, almost 25. I'm very familiar with every square inch of this property. I've walked it extensively. And I think all these ideas regarding passive recreation are, are excellent. I'm not gonna speak to what you may wanna do long-term because that's beyond the scope of, you know, who knows that property. Um, I've been in court over this property uh, with an appraiser um, who said there's very, there's not a lot you can do with it. It's, it has little access to the highway. And um, it's not good for shopping centers. There's a lot of things they, they testify it wasn't good, good for. But I think um, I'd like the towns to consider allowing hunting on it. Um, primarily, when I'm speaking of today, most people only hunt do deer hunting. Uh, and um, it, it does it, it does tell very well with um, all these passive uses. Um, it would not interfere with the gardens. The deer hunting seasons all of rough, for rifle is three weeks long, and uh, it's in November, uh, past the growing season. And um, and I've seen hunters there over the years, over the last you know, as I said, close to twenty five years. Everyone's very respectful to each other. Um, there's never been any problems. And hunting is a valid form of recreation. 
Uh, it, it beats sitting around staring at a TV all day or all day, you know, every day. And it gets a lot of people up and out of the house. And uh, there's never been any problems. I, you know, there's, um, and I would just, I think most, I think anyone who would want to use that property would be more than happy to sign a liability waiver. Uh, and I don't think, I think, and I didn't look, but I think under state law, you may be, at least, I know private landowners are protected. There's a statute that protects a private landowner from any liability if they allow a hunter on their property. Um, and I don't know if that applies to a municipality, but I don't think that's a problem. You know, I mean, it, what's, uh, so I think anyone would be willing to sign, uh, who wanted to hunt, they'd be willing to sign a, a liability waiver. And I'm just thinking in the short term, and even as early as this year, or, you know, because the hunting season starts another couple months. And I know there's, there's bow that starts probably in September, October, and then it follows into the rifle. And then after that, the last few weeks of the year in December, there's what's called black powder hunting. I've never seen anyone out there hunting black powder before. So there's not, the property, there are no shortage of deer in this part of the state. There are as many deer as there are squirrels. And the problem is they like to eat, you know, people's uh, bushes and shrubs and flowers. And it's, it's uh, and, you know, hunting is supported by deep. And, uh, and it's, um, it's an important part of conservation. It's important. Managing the herd is important. And I think it's something the town should seriously consider. And I would just ask that you do that. And um, I'm glad to see that, you know, you're having this meeting and um, hope there's no hard feelings. I was just doing my job. And, um, and I, wish you, I wish you all well, but I'd like, I am very interested to see what you would do. I would seriously like you to consider it. And I thank you for your, for your thoughts you. on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Like John, is it John? John should be able to unmute yourself, John. Yes. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you just identify yourself for the record? Yeah, John. John Sievel, and it's Perry Hill Road. Um, <clears throat> I think that one use for some of this land, and it would be a, a really a fairly small fraction of the land, would be for solar. Um, we wouldn't. It wouldn't make sense to clear any forest land for solar. Um, I don't know about the wetland areas. Um, the, the cleared areas are already might be appropriate, but there are two or three options for solar. One is, is uh, it's a new state program, uh, shared, shared solar. It's actually shared clean energy is the, the, the name of the new state program. And it is set up to allow people of low or moderate income to be able to get a subscription to buy power from a community system uh, for, for uh, people of low or moderate income and also municipalities. So it's, it's, it's managed by um, Eversource. And um, it, it would be a way of sharing some of this land and the benefits of it and the lower electric bills, which I think would be really important with residents of the two towns. There are also uh, two other possibilities that I can think of. One is virtual net metering, which uh, Coventry is involved in. Um, it's, it's having its difficulties. Um, but it's a system whereby the output from the array um, can be um, used to offset the electric bill of the, the town. So we've already generating quite a bit of our own power, especially at the senior center. But uh, in addition to that, um, and as we move more and more toward using electricity to heat our facilities and get away from oil, it would give us an option to really reduce our energy bills. And I think it would be a very productive use for some of that property. And finally, if all else fails, um, there are commercial installers really hungry for sites that are appropriate. 
and I can't say that this is one of those. You know, I don't know uh, about the access to, to utilities and all of that. But I guess bottom line is I, I hope that we can consider um, putting solar on, on, a, on at least a fraction of this land. I think it would benefit all of us in the two towns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. I'm go back to the room. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to speak? Yes. Okay. So my name is Jessica Miller, Tremco Lane in Ashford. I am the executive director for the Ashford Housing Authority. And we recently created a nonprofit affiliate um, named the Ashford Housing Development Corporation. Um, our mission will be to expand affordable housing in Ashford. And um, so within the next you know, few years, we will be looking for a location in Ashford. And ideally it would be town property. Um, we're looking to build affordable housing specifically for seniors and disabled, and it would be with low to moderate income. So the low income is key. Um, we really have no senior housing for low income individuals. And um, that's something that I really wanna bridge that gap uh, within the next few years. So, um, you know, I don't have any proposals or anything like that, but I just <laughs> wanted to throw it out there. We will be looking, so possibly this could be an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, 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 you should be able to unmute yourself. We promise we see all your hands, so we'll see you again. Keep it, John. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things from the- Identify yourself for the record. Sorry, Christina Sebo, Perry Hill Road. I'm also part of the uh, Conservation Commission. I'd just like to um, emphasize one thing that hasn't been mentioned from the uh, Conservation Commission's proposal is that there's an extensive, um, uh, there are extensive logging roads all over the property. So, there's already sort of an incipient trail system, uh, which could be used probably tomorrow by some people. So again, there, there are a whole lot of free things that could be done for the community really soon. And um, I think that would be nice to consider. That's all. Can I, can I ask a follow up to either Christine or um, Val? I don't know if you know any of this. From, from your findings, where those are, are they um, are they kind of centered in one central area? Are they all you over want, the property? You wander all through the property on one of They're Steve's map. Okay. I think on one of Steve's map on the documents, they're shown, but okay. they go all through the property. And in fact, we utilized those roads <laughs> to get back there. Get it was wonderful because usually we have to like, hack through and cut through, but we use those those timbering roads quite extensively to get the equipment in and out. So good call there. Great. Thank you. So there's there's free use already. <laughs> Is there anybody here that would like to make comment? Okay. Claire. Claire? Hi. Hi everyone. I'm Claire Kane. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, Claire. I do not live in town. I represent the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, a nonprofit, and we're based in Rockfall, Connecticut. And part of our mission is to maintain the Blue Blaze hiking trail system, of which the Nipmuc Trail is a part. And really, I just wanted to lend my voice to the concept of passive recreation. We would certainly like to see the trail maintain its continuity through this area. Um, if you're not that familiar with the Nipmuc Trail, it's a 30 mile trail that connects, you know, up through all the way up to Bigelow Hollow State Park, um, really connects some incredible wild natural places. And, you know, if if for some reason the trail was fractured in this area, it, it would really be um, a shame. 
And so I just want to lend our voice as an organization to seeing this property remain in its natural state, uh, maybe with some recreational improvements. We would love to see that. So that's all I wanted to add. And um, I appreciate you guys having this conversation and letting me add some comments. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike? Can't pick. Unmute yourself. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Gantick and I live on Oaks Road in Ashford. I'm a current member of the Ashford Economic Development Commission and the Art Founder Future Commission Committee and a uh, past member of the Conservation Commission. Uh, first, I want to thank the boards of Selectman from Wellington and Ashford for your continued uh, efforts in pursuing this uh, situation here in the Kettle Rock property. Um, I think we've heard a lot of uh, good ideas so far. I think the property offers possibly a lot of uh, opportunity for a lot of diverse uses. Um, but I think it's critically important that uh, the towns consider what I'll call a map, developing a master plan for the property. Um, you know, that I think Val kind of mentioned some of the components of, of a brownfield. And I think uh, really a site reuse assessment and land assessment is really needed to fully evaluate all the site constraints that are out there and, and maybe what sort of potential reuse of the property could be. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can be factored into that. Um, and certainly a master plan would serve, to provide a future roadmap for the town. Cause I think there may be opportunities 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now that may be a benefit to the communities for the use of that property. Obviously we all lost some tax dollars, significant tax dollars. Um, but I think there's certainly a lot of uh, passive uses and other things being used for the property. And I think, um, you know, if you take, um, Think, develop this master plan, I think it also provides an opportunity to um, position the towns for future grant monies um, for various things, even if there's trails or the solar issues, or it, certainly uh, talked about housing development, other things, you're gonna have to have a plan in hand to show somebody when you submit for some kind of grant. Um, so I think I, I really would uh, urge um, that we consider developing this master plan. And, and I, I believe that the Brownsfield program actually does provide grant funding for development of such a plan. Um, so I you know, really, you know, I don't have any specific uses to say that we should do this and that. I really think um, there's certainly our site constraints, but I think we really have to understand how those site constraints kind of fit what, what we possibly could do for best use and, and, and diverse use, of course, um, and also be able to leverage other are the funds out there to, to you know, develop this property over time because I don't think it's going to happen over obviously overnight but uh, I think that's critically important that we we you know access this other round shield funding to develop a true plan so we can fully understand what's going on and certainly a plan that engages the public fully so everybody gets their say and input into it and um, so we have some sound understanding to move forward in a, in a proactive positive um, understanding way of what we should use that property for, for its best use for, for both towns and the public. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to give this brief input. And That's good fine. luck, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, to Michael's point, can I ask, Ann, we're, we're talking about um, kind of developing potential uses mm -hmm. for our application mm -hmm. for remediation. Is what Michael's suggesting a separate grant opportunity or could it be combined with it within this application so is it separate grant funding for brownfields for, for something yeah. like that or, or could it be intertwined with the funds we if we were to receive this grant i'd have to go back and look at the notice but it's possible it would be a later round okay. of funding mm -hmm. um, i think this one's more limited to remediate remedial action funding but maybe another one the next one that could provide for planning um, well, we'd have to check that. Okay. But that might make our application a little bit more attractive if we were looking at a you know, master plan without a potential shovel ready project. Mm -hmm. okay. Val, did you? No, I was going to say, you know, in previous rounds, we've, I've done them, we've done, and they don't want you to take all the money just for planning because they want to see the remediation. But you folks are so close to the end. Um, you know, it would be worth an ask, uh, but but they have previous to this round, and it's exactly right. This round is a little different, mm -hmm. uh, but in previous rounds, they've given you a certain percentage. You can do. EPA does the very same thing. Um, EPA sometimes actually tells you 
don't exceed twenty five thousand dollars or something like that. But so I think the potential is there. Ask. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, for the mm -hmm. great suggestion. How about well, Carl was next. How's it going, Carl? Hi, thanks for the opportunity. I'm Carl Zulick. Um, I don't live in town, but I um, was born and raised there. I own uh, three parcels of property there still, pay taxes. Um, I um, was impressed with the Conservation Committee report. Thanks very much. I, was, um, I saw about the meeting on the Ashford Citizen and um, decided to log in. Uh, but I have not been able to find on the web maps or really more information. So that was very helpful to me. I think there's still work to be done to analyze the site. Um, and proposing uses on a site like this, um, a lot of it's about location. It is a portal to the town of Wellington. It's a portal to the town of Connecticut on Route 44. Um, and um, it's got some great topography and some great natural resources there, obviously. Um, but I don't have a good understanding yet. Like I, looking at the maps, does it abut Camp Connery or is it some distance from Camp Connery's boundary on Route 74? Some distance. There's some distance there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, but I do think that um, some more site analysis would inform us better about the potential uses, you know, things like slope and archaeology, cultural resources. I, you know, Camp Connery used to be owned by my family, and there were a lot of Indian um, graveyards and things like that there that, you know, not many people really knew about, but the state knows about them but that information hasn't been put forward to my knowledge. So I think um, a little bit more on slope, um, a map on wetlands would certainly be useful because it limits development, slope limits development, it limits roads and so forth. But I, again, I, I commend you for what you've done so far. Just hope that there's a little bit more information that comes forth so that we can have um, some more informed input. Um, it's a beautiful piece of property and it's also big. I, I support the Conservation Commission's proposal. Um, I think it, it, there's more to it that could come out, but uh, you know, I'm fa in favor of a public use, but I recognize that it's gonna decrease from the tax base if it is in public use. Thank you. And can I, uh, thank you, Carl. Um, can I just, uh, Bill, um, I thought uh, Kathy Demers, who's chairman of the Willington um, Conservation Commission had joined us and she wasn't sure um, as she's in Vermont if she would be able to have connectivity issues. So uh, the commission, the, the Willington Conservation uh, Commission had thoughts on at, at least the Willington parcels um, and not much different, which is about 41 acres in total, how that may be used. They discussed um, and, and recommend that the town consider keeping at least the northern portion of the Willington property as open space for passive uh, recreation to protect the Nipmunk Trail corridor, which is managed by the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. We saw Isaac Claire um, speak to us. The portion of the property has some wetlands, so it is not really suited um, for any type of extensive development. They believe the southern portion of the Willington property closest to Route 44 is more developable, but also has some farmland soils and open fields. So the town could consider leasing this portion, the property to farmers or use it for community gardens. Um, and so I'll share with the selectmen uh, the maps that she has shown us, which are the same um, that we've already seen. So I think what we see is some alignment yeah. uh, between both of our conservation commissions and okay. in, um, in their suggestions. So I wanted to make sure I shared that. Thank you. Well, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff Silversmith, uh, 95 Seacar Road, Ashford. And I just wanna thank the Conservation Commission for the thought and the effort that they put into all of their um, recommendations and as well as thanking everyone for who came forward with uh, their recommendations for this. I guess mine isn't so much a recommendation as it is a uh, ditto on a number of the things, especially the 
uh, passive recreation and or solar. But I guess my question comes down to, or my input comes down to, um, if for some reason um, putting in for this grant is does not become specific enough or our reasons for, and what we want to do with the land are not specific enough for the grant, are ARPA funds available? I mean, if it's not broadband, which kind of gets a free pass for ARPA funds, recreation and solar energy seemed like it would have a strong secondary use or a secondary use for ARPA funds. I believe those are eligible items, Jeff. And while I believe they're eligible items, I'm not sure how much of um, Ashford's ARPA funds have been committed. Willington is down to about 200,000 roughly of our 1.7 million um, uncommitted. So it would certainly limit um, our abilities. But can, can I ask Anne, so both to, to Car some of Carl's points and, and to Jeff's, um, can you talk to us a little bit about you know, why we're holding this and, and what we specifically are looking for in this application round um, and why we're asking for um, some ideas. Again, we're looking for ideas. We do not have to have a hard concept. We definitely don't have a shovel ready project and don't expect that to happen by, you know, next week. Right, and, and thank you. And, and we don't anticipate uh, for the selectmen to come out of this meeting and say, yes, we're gonna do passive recreation or follow the conservation plans or we're going to do master planning or we're going to do solar or we're gonna do hunting or any of the suggestions. The purpose of what we're doing tonight is, is the purpose itself. To hear from the community, to write about in the application what it is the towns are doing in preparation of moving forward. If in the next round, planning funding, if it's the decision of the collective selectmen to move forward with developing a master plan, that kind of, it evolves out of this meeting. This is and it'll be their decision to make. And also it provides them because we'll have, there may have to be some matching funding from the towns. So I'm not sure how your governments all work, whether that's go to the board of finance and then the selectmen or you request to the board of finance, but there may be some matching funding, but this all helps to provide an informed decision um, so that it, so that there is a reasoned approach to what we're doing. So that's really the, the purpose. We're not looking to say, yes, this is going to be this type of development. That's not the purpose tonight. It's to hear everybody's collective ideas. Right. So, so we're, you know, I just want to select everybody's expectation. We're not looking to come out of this with, right, with, with a plan. I don't think you're going to hear any of us say, we are definitely using this for this resource. It's to make our application for remediation grants the most attractive so that we actually get the grant funding. So if, if we can, it's going to be a challenge. That's right. Because because they want shovel ready projects. They want shovel ready projects. You know, I've, um, I'm going to be part of a Brownfields um, coalition meeting next Wednesday that's being hosted in Stanford. And I'm on a panel with the DECD and DEP people. And they're happy showing their befores and their afters. And that's their focus for the funding. Even if the after, it, and it's fine for an after, if ultimately that's the decision of the towns, is uh, public parks or trails, that's fine. They've got nasty before pictures, and then they'll show pretty looking trails or community gardens as they're after, or they could show affordable housing after, or whatever it is. So they want a before, and they want you to be prepared to do the after, so that two years from now, they can show the, the, the pictures. That's right. Catherine, it, you had a question. Of Anne. And um, this is all very helpful, mm -hmm. getting input from our public for both towns mm -hmm. as to what we would like mm -hmm. have done, to have done with that property or how to use it. Um, but again, when you're filling out this application, you're it, or helping to fill out this application, we have to put something in there that shows that we are moving in a direction. Mm -hmm. Can you give maybe elaborate just a little bit more on that? Well, it's going to be a general. I right. mean, it, it, we, it's going to right. be general, general, but right. you're getting a sense. Right, right. We're, it's it's going good. to be general. We can't we can't pick any concept and say this is what we're going to do because we don't know. Right. Yeah. So it's going to be very general. These were the concepts that um, you know were discussed this evening. There's a, a variety of them or plan is going to be, let's, no pun intended, dig down and explore these options further. 
so, and see and what is the best best um, opportunity for the towns. And would it be including possibly saying that we would be looking at a master plan? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I may, the thing is that we know when we write grants, you know, we sometimes get hooked into what they're asking and we, we can't hear because we don't have it. But what we've talked about is, I hope you folks understand here that the amount of money you're asking for, for remediation is just about equal to what most applicants ask for for investigations. Think about that. So that's, we are we are that's your... And then, that's right. listen, we just need this little bit teeny much right. just to push us over. And yeah, we don't have a developer yet because well, we're so close to being done. Mm -hmm. We'll have one. Right. Give us our money. Mm -hmm. We'll finish it. We'll do the master plan. God bless. So, and, and, and that we're taking a recent approach in how we're doing exactly. it. Right. And, yeah. and, and our, the difference to this year as opposed to in prior, most prior funding rounds, we own the property now. You know, they, they, they don't, the statute somewhat prohibits um, you from a, obtaining a grant to do remediation on property that you don't own, which is what happened when we looked last, the last time. time. Right. But now we own the property mm -hmm. because it's different because they don't want you to improve the property owner who right. caused the contamination or neglected to deal with the contamination. You don't, they don't want that person to benefit. Right. Mm -hmm. So the pitch is, look how far we come all by ourselves. <laughs> and I also think emphasizing how close we are to the finish line mm -hmm. right. on this thing when it comes to remediation. Right. I mean, the, st the state loves to give us uh, goals that we have to do. And a big one over the years has been, you don't own the property. Right. We've overcome that last right. year. Right. And, you know, I was a bit surprised when I heard that the wetlands had never been mapped. And I, I think it only makes a lot of sense to put priority on doing a development plan, right. map our wetlands, right. and, and be able to recognize and point out exactly what we either have or don't have there for potential development of whatever sort we decide. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even that, was there's an easy way to do that, because you can send somebody out there with your existing wetlands map and just say, yeah, it's pretty much this. So it could be a few days mm -hmm. as opposed to three weeks. There's ways to, to move forward, but you want to know where you're going with inset from a radiation standpoint. On, on your, your experience with both of you, do you have any idea if we were looking at a, a development plan, what we're talking about in dollars? Well, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of existing information. Okay. Econ, kind of the eco, there's a lot of things that because you're not actually developing something, you can use just to inform what you want to do. So in other words, you open up pods of areas. You don't have to have it right down to the you know, two foot line because yeah. you're going in for a site plan. Right. So there's a way to economize there. I have done them for six or 7,000 and I've done them for 50,000. The key here is what are the concepts? You folks will know that, you know, People are willing to doodle till the cows come home. So you don't spend your money doodling. Spend your money on something real, you know, some kind of compatible coexistence based on what we're hearing from folks and do two or three concepts and see if that resonates with folks. And I like your low range. Yeah. All right. So we have, so we're doing a little bit of what we said we did, Bill and I both yeah. said we didn't want to do. We don't want to yeah. take up yeah. all the air in the room. We want to hear from you. So is there anyone in the room that wants to speak before we go back online? Yes, sir. And then we'll come back to you online. I see out your hand. Yes, I'm Keith Lipker. I live on North Road in Ashford. And uh, I, you know, hear all these proposals and I think they're great. I do believe that there's enough uh, space there that we could do perhaps mixed use. And what I'd like to see is that perhaps maybe along the Route 44 area, that there might be some opportunity for some type of development that would generate some tax dollars, which would help with the upkeep of the property, because even if it's used for recreation, you still have to up, you know, provide upkeep. And there's also the liabilities that go with that. And so I would like to also see a disinterested third party come in and examine the property and tell us for certain without any bias, pre-existing bias, either for you know development or recreation or any of that, tell us what uh, what parts of the land might be suitable 
for development or if it's all going to be for recreation or some could some of it be used for uh, you know um, low income housing or solar or what have you so that, that's what I would recommend. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to start with those who have not had an opportunity and then we'll circle back to anyone who's spoken again. So I'll start with Janet. Hi, I'm Janet Bellamy. I live on Sunset Drive in Ashford. And I just like to point out that I'm, well, I'd like to thank all the selectmen for your work on this. But also I'd like to say, um, I see an, an, over, an overarching agreement by people that the property should be used for the community, for everyone to enjoy in one way or another, whether it's passive recreation or low income housing or solar to help people with their electric bills. Um, so I, I see this as a theme and I'm very encouraged by it. And I hope that we can do that because it is just a beautiful piece of property. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, anyone else in the room? Right, I'll keep coming back. Susan? Susan Eastwood? Yes. Susan Eastwood? There you go. Oh, one more time. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm having trouble with my unmute button. Um, <laughs> thank you. This is great. All these ideas are really inspiring, really. I, I agree with Janet. It looks like a theme is sort of emerging. Um, and I, I wanted to say that um, I'm the chair of the Ashford Clean Energy Task Force, as some of our members have spoken already. And thank you, John, for bringing all those details about community solar and so forth up, because those are really great. Um, and really, I think that would be a great use for us, a portion of the property, as John already said. But, but I wanted to just bring a little history, because a number of solar developers have approached the town in the past. Um, even I think maybe 10 so years or more ago, because there were a lot of incentives for putting solar on brown fields. Um, and I would have to research to see what the current situation is. But, you know, I just was always personally a little hesitant about that without, you know, looking into other options. And, you know, just this one company comes forward, you know, and wants to do something. So I think I really liked Mike's idea of the master plan to see what's the best use for the land. I love the all the Conservation Commission's ideas as well for the use of the town. But I just wanted to give that historical perspective and, you know, urge that we look at it from a whole community perspective, not just one developer coming in, like, like has happened in the past. And of course, those all fell through because of the complications that we all know about. So now we don't have to deal with that, which is great. And thanks for all your work on that, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. You're in the room, just wave your hand. We'll keep an eye out. Um, I think um, absent any first time, we'll go back to Loretta. Um, I just wanted to add to what Carl had said about knowing more about the land, and that would be the purpose of the forest management plan, which um, the uh, Yale Forest uh, Forestry Program in Ashford would be willing to do a forest management plan. And in that, they would not only go through the lay of the land, but they would also from other forest management plans that I've seen, they also look at the history of the land. So I think you had mentioned something like that. And the other thing is in terms of a long-term plan, what we were thinking about, if it became a nature center, education center, it could then become a tourist attraction, which would then help present businesses in town and also offer an opportunity for new business to come in. And then the third thing is just that the state is very interested in increasing open space. They feel that that's really important. And I know Ashford has a lot of open space, but some of it isn't permanently protected. But to take away open space might be a little problematic. So if, and, and certainly we could use certain parts of it, something like a solar thing would be right, I think in line with our plan, but um, that, by saying we want to use conserve this land and use it for the public, I think would be very helpful in terms of the grant. Thank you again. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, Carl. 
Thanks again, uh, Carl Zulick, um, Zychek Road, Shady Road, and Westford Hill. Um, I um, like some of the discussion and where it's going. Um, and, um, you know, I guess I want to say, have a little bit of a concern. Uh, I don't live in Connecticut anymore, but I know that I pay taxes there and the taxes are very high in Connecticut, if you're not aware of it. I think you are, and um, <laughs> only, aware. Slightly. only slightly aware, right? And so you know that it, that is a concern to town residents. I am a conservationist at heart, so um, I think if there was any possibility that you could look at a multiple use kind of development plan, where you had um, maybe something in there for housing, maybe something in there for commercial. And then a lot of open space, recreation, trails, fishing, you know, or, or whatever other things that the that the site would allow might be um, might be worth pursuing and might play well with the state. So, kind of a, in in, uh, in my line of work, we called that multiple use. Um, I also would point out that you've got a resource there to help you with um, development plans and site analysis, GIS at the University of Connecticut. They've got a big department and um, I'm pretty sure you could find folks there that would do some GIS maps of, of um, slope and topography and aspect uh, for solar studies and, and all of those kinds of things it would be very quick using their GIS capabilities. Um, and, um, Anyway, those are those are a couple of other thoughts. Thank you. Cole. Thank you. Um, I promise you, there are some Wellington folks um, participating, and I know they're listening. Although we may not hear from as many of them, like we have forty-one of the three hundred acres. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and again, this all of this discussion does not narrow our focus to this is what we're going to do. We're not committing to actual use, um, even in this application. It's to you know, have some concepts and ideas the selectmen can determine that we'll use in our narrative to hopefully uh, achieve the grant. So um, is there any more people? Is there another page? There is another page, but if you raise your hand, it brings you to the front sure. uh, of that. So if they've raised their hand. Um, so Kelsey, can you just kind of scroll through the pages that are there just in the event someone doesn't know how to use those tabs and is waving frantically at us? Most people aren't on the I, I'm on the I, on the phone. I'm on a dial-in phone, so I can't raise my hand, but I'd like okay. to say something. Okay, I'll just ask you to identify yourself for the record. My name is John Kopeck, North Road in Ashford. Uh, I think it was the last speaker that uh, pretty much took the wind out of my sails there. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to make everyone happy. <laughs> I want to make everybody reasonably happy. So I think mixed use is the way to go. Um, I think absolutely some sort of development to the south and to the northeast and preservation of the wetlands, um, do trails in there, whatever, doesn't really matter. Um, but certainly something with business because taxes are getting out of hand. Mine went up 20% this year alone. Uh, and just putting residential housing in there isn't going to help that situation all that much. So any kind of commercial or light industrial use somewhere on that property. I think would really help the taxpayers out in addition to still having plenty of land to preserve for the Nitmuk Trail and the wetlands and all that stuff. Um, the solar panels, <laughs> I'm just afraid that turns it into a brownfield again because those things are not recyclable yet and they're full of toxic materials. Um, so, you know, just, just something to think about, but definitely mixed use so that everybody can have uh, some degree of happiness out of whatever happens to that property. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Is there anyone else who's just on um, a phone? You, you don't have the ability to raise your hand like those um, who are working from a computer. You should be able to unmute yourself. So we'll go to someone else. And if that's the case, when they're done speaking, I encourage you to call out while we monitor that. So I'll go back. Anyone in the room? OK. Um, Christine, I believe you are next. Uh, yeah, so I just want to reiterate about um, uh, Loretta had talked to the Yale forest people and they are willing to do a uh, forest survey free 
free, F-R-E-E. -E. Yeah, we yeah. like the report. They do an amazing job. Um, we had it done on, on my land and John Siebel's land, and they, they look at the geology, they look at the history, they look at the kinds of trees, the kinds of everything on the land. It's really quite an amazing report, free. So that would be a really nice place to start. And also, um, uh, I, I fully agree with mixed use down the line, but that is going to take some development plan, which I think is also very important. Um, it just seems to me when we talk about this upcoming grant, um, I've heard it said they want to see something shovel ready or they want to see a, a kind of a plan going forward. I think if you start with passive recreation, which doesn't change the land and. I'm sorry, go ahead, Christine. Oh, you're muted. You muted yourself. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so you start with passive recreation and you outline that as the Conservation Commission has sort of done. Um, and you say, okay, so that's a starting place. We also then go to, we're working on a development plan with some group or whatever, whatever, um, to see what goes on next. But I think then you have a pathway that um, is sort of obvious and, and gives a direction, which I would think a grant, grant um, uh agency would like to see um so thank you all right so steve will come back to you uh, i think we heard from you earlier so i'm going to start with uh, is it brand brandis um, am i reading that let's put these glasses on brandis and let me i i hope unmute. i said that right one second be on mute on mute please you're unmuted you're unmuted Okay, good. Um, I live right can, next can, door to the Can property. you identify yourself for the record? Okay, Brenda Sandrade, and I live on Squaw Hill Road, right adjacent to the property. And in the past, I've done uh, studies of the uh, property for one of the owners in the past wanted to make a golf course out of the property. And it was denied because an aquifer that, um, provides the water for Willimantic goes right under the property and would have been polluted. So I hope this care taken in deciding what mixed use is made back there because it, it's, you don't want to pollute all the water and you can't, they won't, they'll refuse it. I'm sure the water commission, I would think would have refused it. That's my concern. Thank you so much. All right, Steve. Uh, yes, um, I, I just wanted to anyway, point out- Steve, can you identify yourself for the record? Oh, yeah, sure. Steve Maritko, Varga Road, Ashford. Um, uh, one further constraint on uh, developing the property is um, uh, access. Uh, access to the property is really limited to Route 44, the open, uh, town-owned parcels on Route 44, which, by the way, have, uh, oh, I think they're probably um, a little under 10 houses along Route 44. And the end of Carosi Road, too, uh, which is a very quiet road, and you'd have to cross over a, a stream there. Um, um, those are really the only access points. There's no... Um, no access in the north or the west, um, and in the east again is only uh, only off of Karosi Road. That's all. Thank you, Steve. Anyone here in the room? Is there anyone online who wants to speak? Again, if you're on a, a phone only, you can unmute yourself. Kind of call her out. What I will say is that the selectmen, um, you know, plan to, to hold a special meeting so that we can talk about the things that were talked about in this meeting to kind of come to a consensus of what that narrative use will look like in our grants application. Um, and then I think I, I speak for Bill myself, we anticipate multiple, multiple meetings uh, as far as use goes. Again, this isn't a 
whatever everyone says tonight is what we're doing. We, we have lots of conversation to have and lots of public conversation with your input um, as to what we use. But I, I did love the, um, look, I love free. I think everyone mm -hmm. here loves anything we can get that's beneficial to our communities for free. And as Christine pointed out, if the Yale Forest um, you know, is willing to do a management plan, that might be something because we own the properties um, that as selectmen we can you know, potentially move forward with um, because there's no cost. We're not waiting for any funding for that. So um, GIS. yeah, I would anticipate um, at our selectmen's meeting here in some conversation or at least some suggestions from myself that we try to move forward with some of those things working with our conservation commissions. So um, Christine, thanks for pointing the free portion out. Carl, you had your hand up again. And I see you just put it down. Oh, you're back yeah. up. <laughs> no, I, did. Um, I just, um, a, a lot of the organizations I work with don't consider adequately the long-term costs of um, public uses. And I would just remind everybody, when you build trails, when you build any hardscapes or buildings or anything like that, there's maintenance costs, uh, winter, summer, erosion, um, lawn mowing, uh, you, even with community gardens, um, there will be costs. And um, that's part of my um, thinking about the multiple uses, if you have some form in your proposal where you can identify a way to offset those long-term costs, whether they be a trust or um, asking for money from the state that would go into a, a trust for long-term maintenance of the site that you end up developing. But anyway, don't, don't forget about those, those long-term costs when you develop. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Carl. Anyone in the room? All right. See, no, I, I'd room? just like to echo what Eric is saying. This, although we are, our predecessors uh, have been working on this for years and many of us involved, this is sort of the beginning of the latest phase to get this remediation done. And the light is at the end of the tunnel. We'll now go into the planning stages uh, additively. And, this won't be the last of our public hearings. We do have a special selectmen's meeting that we'll be coordinating with Willington prior to our uh, application process. We're working on that. Um, when that does happen, it will be both in person and on Zoom. So if you're interested in joining in and listening in on that, um, you're welcome to do that. We just has not been able to uh, focus in on a specific time of day. I think by the time the we works. leave the room, we'll have a Okay, but uh, <laughs> yeah. thank you all for your uh, your input. It's important to us. We're listening to you, um, and stay involved. Yeah. And and I would say for for residents online who are and in the room who are here tonight, and those who might be listening to this and watching it back, um, this was the first of what I said will be potentially more and many public hearings. But that doesn't mean you have to wait for a public hearing um, to shoot your ideas over to either uh, the Selectman's Office in Ashford or the Selectman's Office in Willington. Um, we're always, uh, my door is always open to hear those suggestions. We compile them and can bring them into future conversations. So if anyone has anything beyond tonight, I encourage you to um, you know, send it. I know if I don't write it down when I'm talking about it, I won't remember it. Um, and we're welcome to hear that outside of the public hearing. So, All right, I believe that uh, our agenda has been complete and I will entertain a motion to adjourn the uh, Ashford Board of Selectmen Silence. So moved. Second. A second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I would entertain a motion um, to adjourn the Willington Selectman's meeting. So moved. Move Selectman Bulick. Is there a second? I don't know that I still see Eliza. So I will second that. It's a non debatable matter. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all again. Enjoy your evening. And this uh, video will be posted um, in, in whatever manner both towns post their um, meetings. Thank you all. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Folks. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, Christina, and I should have publicly done this, Christina.